some edges, huh? Yeah, put the profile on the edge of this sign. I'll tell you what, you just gotta love everything a router can do, don't you? I think the list will be shorter if we see <laughs> what it wouldn't do. That's true. What kind of bit are you using? That's a whole other video. On this episode of the Warrior Woodshop, we're going to talk routers and router safety. Stay tuned. What would we say routers could do? Uh, probably the thing we use for the most in here are decorative edges. And they get up into the advanced levels, you actually can make joinery with them. I'd say we could break routers into four different areas. Like we got two of them in front of us. What'd you call that one? Uh, standard? Some people call it a fixed base. Okay. Because you lock it, it stays locked. We got this one over here, it's we call that one a plunge. That's because it has a lever right there and unlock it, it could drop right in the middle. So when you're carving signs, that makes it a lot easier to control where you start and stop. Start sounds, in the middle. sounds like a benefit. In the beginning of the video, I was routing the edge of this sign with the fixed base, but if it's a small piece or I don't have a good size workbench, you can always go to the table router. Basically, instead of bringing the router to the work, so a router and a table. Router and a table. And the, the newest one that's been in the router world for, I'd say 20, 25 years, but it's really taken off in the last 10, is CNC routing. That's a whole different ball game. We're gonna cover that for the advanced classes in a different video. That sounds like a plan. There's some things that apply to all those four categories of routers, whether it's a table router, hand router, plunge router, this next group of things we're going to go over applies to them all. Like, keep your bits sharp. Remember that from general safety? I mean, if a kid notices a dull bit, what should they do? I would hope they would tell us about it. Some of the, also, you want to look for chips. Sometimes the a kid before hit a nail or a staple, and it'll actually ruin the profile of the bit. Yeah, so. they don't realize that what you see on that profile is going to be what you see on your board. Yeah, remember general safety? We talked about unplugging. Definitely, because if you Notice on this particular router, it has a toggle switch and a guard. If that guard got broke and it was plugged in and I rotated this router just wrong. It looks like it'd be easy to hit that switch. Oh, that would be a disaster if you had your hands in here and that thing turned on on accident at 10,000 RPM. You saw me in the beginning of the video, safety glasses, ear protection, you know, if you're allergic to some of the dust, dust mask. You know, you're going to be around these machines close proximity so of all the machines i'd say dust or ear protection definitely because that thing is loud you're, you're right down here you're in decibel range always clamp your work i mean you got to keep the board from moving around wait a minute when i came up before you didn't have that clamped oh yeah you can use one of these uh router mats for like sign carving and light duty routing you know it's you see them on the dashes of cars, but this is a bigger version. I mean, it keeps this thing from, for light duty operation. It's what we call a router mat. It'll, it'll substitute for that makes sense. a clamp. And hey, you don't have to worry about the clamps getting in the way. Ooh, before you do that. Hey, you want to plug this in for me? It's down there on the ground, I'm gonna grab the cord. Uh, did you check the uh, switch? Actually, this time I did. It is definitely in the off. Oh, nope, there we go. Good thing I checked. It must have been in a router table. <laughs> And we, you definitely want to check these because a lot of times we will use the motors in router tables and then go back to a hand base. So of all the tools you're going to find this, it's definitely going to be... Well, that's because we have switches on the router yeah. tables, so we hit, they're on all the time. Sweet. So when you actually start it up, it's probably a good idea, don't you think, to kind of hold on to it a little bit when you actually flip the switch? Hey, you, uh, routers are like a race car. They go from zero to 10,000 in less than a second. So. That was, that was just a jumping from the startup. Yeah, from zero, guys, from zero to 10,000 in less than a second, that is some torque. It's, it's, you're gonna wanna have control of that thing when you turn it on. We, how, how long should I wait 
from when I turn it on to where I start carving my sign. I mean, from what I just heard from this one, it only takes about a second, maybe two, to get up to full speed. Full speed, that's, that's definitely something we wanna make sure. That's general safety, guys. Remember that from last unit? or a couple units ago, let the machine reach full speed. Some of them do have adjustable dials like this one does back here, but still, wherever it's set at, let it wind up. Absolutely. What if I want a really deep channel, like to lock a chair together? That's, that's gonna be hard on the motor, isn't it? Hard on the motor, hard on the bit, so what do you think the uh, proper way to do that is? Well, if you have stop locks and guides, we could probably do it in multiple passes. Oh, that's an idea. So it saves a bit. It, because when the bits get hot, they get dull. When the bits work hard, the motor works, or the motor's working hard. So keep your hands away from the underside. And that's just common sense, isn't it? You would I think mean, so. I mean, unfortunately, I know from firsthand experience <laughs> uh, what it feels like to touch a rotter bit when it's moving. It, it's Pounding your hand with a hammer would feel better. Oh, so it's more than a little tickle. It's definitely more than a tickle. Looks good. I'm ready to, uh, I gotta touch up a couple of letters. Can you change that bit for me? Oh, huh. yeah, sure. Yeah, make sure it's unplugged. Yeah, I'm about ready to say something. Wait a minute before you change it. Yeah, it's a little warm. We're completely done with it. Just so we don't get accidental startups. Make sure it's unplugged. Keep it away from the edge of the table. All those rules we talked about in general safety, they apply to each and every single tool. Now hold on, you mean that they're just not like gone? We have to come back to them again? Yeah, they all, they apply to every Single tool. With they board like remember. this, you want to router the end grain first so it prevents chip out. It's not going to prevent it. Well, I don't have any chip out. What do you mean prevent? I, it would prevent it, didn't it? Uh, no, it's still going to happen. What we're getting at is when you cro go across the grain, you're going to get a little bit of chip out. And if you go at a reasonable rate, it's going to chip out in the same place that the long side is going to cut it away. So if we do the long side first, it chips out the damage, or chips out and leaves the damage exposed. If we do the short side first, or the cross grain, it only chips where the long grain is gonna cut, and eventually it goes away. That makes sense. Speed matters when you're routering, because if you go too slow, you end up with all that friction creating heat, leaving burn marks on the edge. Hard to sand out. So, I'm just gonna go really fast, right? Uh, you got a chance of kickback then. That sounds like working speed from general safety, isn't it? It does sound like that. So you've got to find the right speed for the material you're using and unfortunately we can't just say go this fast because if you're working with pine it's easy. If you're working with cherry or maple you gotta go just fast enough to stay ahead of the burn basically. <laughs> you're gonna end up sanding on those materials. Experience. That's what it comes down to. So. Try a practice block before you go routering your finished one. That's actually really good advice. How does a router bit stay in the router? This particular piece here is called a collet. Similar to a chuck on a drill, but a chuck on a drill is adjustable. Collets are not. It's really important that they have that solid grasp because the router bit spins so fast where drill bits don't. So, a collet grabs 360 degrees around the bit. Well, you got to make sure that you know what size shaft of bit that you have so you have the right collet. If you can see, this is a quarter inch collet with a quarter inch bit. These are both the same style of bit. They're both roundovers. But this half, what's a half inch? Why would you invest in, these are more money. They're bigger, they're more money, they're heavier, but they also reduce the vibration which actually gives you a neater cut. Check your router's manual for specific instructions on how to change the bits and collets for each, because each make and model vary. Some requires two wrenches, other have a shaft lock. Again, check your manual. We're not gonna show you how to do that on this video because there's too many to show. How do I hold the router? Does it, does it matter? I mean, should I? 
As far as relation to how you're holding it, it doesn't really matter. But the one thing you want to make sure of is that you put your pressure over the wood because otherwise the router is going to want to tilt like that and tilt off. So what am I going to do with this hand? That's going to be pushing it up against the edge. So you can see in, that if I let go of the router, it's going to tip. So the outside hand keeps it against the edge. The inside hand basically keeps it on the work. On the work. Well, does direction matter? It absolutely matters, but you got to know which way the bit's turning. Well, the router turns clockwise. So I guess we want to go clockwise. No, we actually want to go counterclockwise. No, wait a minute. You just said it's clockwise. Well, we want to go against the rotation. Oh, that makes sense. What about the inside of a picture frame? If this had a hollow area, we wanted to router that side. So we want to go clockwise. Actually, yeah, you're right. But wasn't it just counterclockwise on the outside? No, wait a minute. Now you're confusing me. There's got to be a simple way to say this. Go against the rotation of the bit? I, I like that. Go against the rotation. But how do you know which way the bit's turning? Well, if it runs off like a race car, <laughs> that you're, you're going with the bit. That and would make sense. So, I've heard you say in your demos where you could start and get a little bit of feel. Again, use that pressure, go a little slow. You can always sand off a burn mark. It's true. But, you, but against the rotation. So on the outside it's counter, on the inside it's clockwise. But if you just remember against the rotation, that's the way we worded our quiz. And for our woodworking classes is against the rotation. That works in every scenario. Against the rotation works. So are we gonna cover all the bits here? Didn't you hear me in the beginning? That's a whole other video because there's hundreds of router bits out there. Hundreds? And then within each type, there's different size. I mean, we got two different bits here that are considered the same, but they're different sizes. That sounds overwhelming. Yeah, so as far as a woodworking class is concerned, check with your class webpage because we'll put a PowerPoint or a video or a little slide up there of the bits that we're going to let you use in our class. There's just so many of them. I don't think we could cover it on a YouTube video in a reasonable amount of time. So we don't use all of them? Yeah, definitely don't use them all. But there's, but there's companies out there that's all they sell. Oh, wow. They make their, their whole year salary just on router bits. Depth of cut is something you want to consider and keep track of. What would you say the maximum depth is? We just discussed it earlier, but... It's an eighth to a quarter of an inch, no more than a quarter. This, again, prevents the bit from getting hot, overworking the motor. When bits get hot, they get dull. Absolutely. You, could always, you don't want to be the student last year that was routing with a half inch diameter bit, half an inch deep. Oh right under the smoke detector. <laughs> Needless to say, we had an unscheduled fire drill. Grooving bits, they're designed to be used in the middle, like the V bit that we use most commonly in sign making. If you want to make a straight line, how am I going to hold that router straight? There's a variety of ways of doing that. They actually make a fence that'll fit on the router if you wanted to get one of those. What if I'm cheap? Like me. Like you. You can take a board and clamp it to it. So when you're using a grooving bit, if you're not doing freehand work like sign making, you definitely want to set up some sort of straight edge, whether it's a factory manufactured unit or you simply do it garage style, woodworker method and clamp a board down. Absolutely. The fixed base router or the standard router is the most common, the, you know, it's the most frequently used. So there's three different sizes. We got two of the three out here. What's this one? That, I call that a trim router. It's bit, you know. Is that for the vertically challenged? <laughs> well, little trivia, what was the first company that made that? Or that size? Uh, Dremel. Dremel. Technically Dremel is a, a mini router, but I don't think that was the first one, was it? I don't know. So, I've, I've heard people say Bosch. It got, they call it the Colt. Yeah, little blue one. Yeah. Yeah. So that explains that one particular kid we have in class. That's why he's called Colton, because it's a little bit smaller. Oh, I thought they were referring to Parker. <laughs> <laughs> but where would you use a small router like that? Uh, I'm thinking probably on something, a smaller piece where a larger one might possibly not fit on there. They'll do a lot of what this one will do. The, this is more of the standard, more common size. What would you say those are? 75 to 150 bucks? 
Eh, roughly. Around a hundred dollar range. Yeah. The the so we got what a half to one horse motor. Sounds about right. These are start out at three quarter. They go up almost to two horse. I think one and three quarter, something like that. So these start out at about a hundred dollars. You can get a Walmart special for fifty bucks, but you get what you pay for there. Yeah, same thing at Harbor Freight. Yeah. This is the one and three quarter model. It's the industry standard, Porter Cable, DeWalt, they're the most common. One of the things we really like about it is that the whole entire base comes off. Yeah. It makes bit changing a lot easier on this one. You gotta stick the wrenches in there. Oh, that sounds like a pain. And a lot of those Harbor Freight ones, the Black & Deckers, you still gotta, the other thing you can do. Oh, my old Craftsman's like that. Yeah. You can get a wrench in there. You, it, 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 it. Yeah. But buy an extra base, Mount a new subplate to it, and in a home workshop, I'm by myself. I can't be using two motors at once, but now I've got myself a router table and a handheld router. Nice. What are these, $30, $40 for an extra base? Mm, that's worth it. So, definitely. Definitely better than $150 for a new router. You can even buy kits now that have plunge routers with them. So, this one motor can serve all three purposes. Table router, fixed base router, and plunge router. You get what you pay for, but... So, when you're looking at a router, you might want to consider one that, uh, that the base comes off. Well, what about that one down there? Because that doesn't look like it's going to fit on here. No, I mean, yeah, compare the... This is, we call it the big dog or big daddy, whatever version you want to use. These are used in the CNC's, the router tables. I mean, that's a three and four horse motor. Wow. I mean, that's, that's a table saw motor basically running this router. So, there, if you notice, there's not even handles on it. They're designed to go on a router table. CNC, that's what they're more used for. But so would that be used for bigger bits? Definitely gonna have bigger bits, but the bits cost more, so does the router. We're talking three hundred dollars for this one. Wow. At starting range. But so this is your more common. To adjust the settings, you literally unlock it, follow your manufacturer's rules. I just get down and sight it. Well, especially in something like this where it's a round over. On here where we want maybe an exact depth of cut, metal ruler. Could do that. But they're going to change or have different settings, different, you know, each manufacturer. Everybody's different. Best way to actually know what you have on yours is to actually look at the manual and do a little reading. Because there's so many different varieties out there, our woodworking classes, we're just going to put a uh, link to a page on the classroom website that's going to go over the basic parts. I mean, you've got your handles, your switch your depth lock, a sub base is the removable piece so you can put different jigs on it. But again, there's so many different makes and models. We're gonna show you what we use in our class on the class webpage. So refer to that to answer, to finish up your study guide. Yeah, so if you have any questions other than that, refer to your manual. When it comes to router tables, there's, I would say three basic styles. A router table is where it literally has the motor mounted upside down in some sort of table. Would you agree with that explanation? Yeah, you were talking about that earlier. So there's not much to them. It's, this is what we call a manufactured one where you can go to Harbor Freight, Home Depot, Walmart, Lowe's, and you just add your own router. It's got a couple wing nuts, the fences adjust. Looks kind of small. Yeah, it's definitely, this is on the lower end. There are, Bosch makes a really nice one. Okay. But it's, I think, 150 bucks just for the table. Oh, plus 150 for a router? It's starting to get a little pricey. You could do it the, the, the woodworker way. You could build your own table. A little plywood, maybe a little laminate if you want. I mean, this, definitely, you can size it whatever you want. In fact, that TV show used to be on New Yankee Workshop. Yeah. They're, they said their most requested video was for the router table project. Not any of the other projects, but that's the one they sold the most. The big thing, are, uh, there's a third style, which we're not really gonna focus on in this video. It's called a shaper. It's pretty much an all-in-one unit. The motor's permanent. Cabinet shops, things like that. It, the one that I have in our workshop is a five horsepower motor. That sounds expensive. It starts out at $1,000. Our table saw has a five horse motor, so you're not gonna see those in most garage workshops. So we're gonna kind of focus on in fact, it really, the rules we talk about are the same, okay. whether you're using this style or that style, and I like that one a little better. It looks nicer. <laughs> so, it starts out as you got, we've got a couple of uh, lo loosening knobs on the back so the fence can slide forward. Okay, sounds like an advantage. 
Okay. So we could actually do a slot in the middle of the board or we could pull it up and round over an edge. So if I have a small piece, like the edge of a shelf bracket or something, that's going to be trying to, even a Colt router is going to be difficult. You got a nice flat surface here, probably going to be a whole lot easier. You can use things like push blocks, push pads, so you don't definitely don't violate the margin of safety. In fact, the fence is three inches tall. Kind of coincides with our margin of safety, doesn't it? Yeah, how ironic. So if you have to put your hands below the fence, figure out some way to, and same thing with the, the zone of the push plate here. That's about three inches in front. Let me see if we can get this back here. Okay, like we said, the, the router, it's the same router, just got a different base plate. And you'll find in our workshop, right here at the school, we actually swap motors. It's faster than changing bits sometimes. Okay. Well, if you do that, switch is always on on this, right? Because we have a switch here on the side. We call that a safety switch. Because imagine trying to reach underneath here and find that switch to turn it off, especially in a hurry. So we've actually got this in the on position. And then that, right now, everything's unplugged, but that'll activate this router. So sometimes we don't intentionally do it. Sometimes we have the kids grab the router motors for us. Don't forget to turn this off. So again, we mentioned it earlier in the video of all the tools to be checking the bits for. This would be number, or the switch, this is number one. Yeah. But again, check them all. Come on, that's general safety. To adjust it, you just do the same thing. This is hanging. Okay, ask for your instructor if you're not sure how to do that. Usually the beginner kids, it's all, all set up. The advanced kids, they do a lot more adjusting. Just depends on the project. But that just sits there. Some models it gets mounted. You know, it just depends on what make and model. Little little uh, redneck ingenuity back say, here. What, what is this? You can hook a shot back up to it. Oh, cool. So, and then we can put a, we took it off for the video, but there's a piece of plexiglass that goes over the top just to kind of give you, what do we call them, dummy guards? That's, yeah. Because they're not going to stop your hand. Okay, it's a term came from the construction industry, dummy railings. They're just a caution tape. They're not really going to stop you from falling. It's kind of tell you, stay away from it. So, just because there's a guard there, don't let down your safety. Feed direction matters. <laughs> I get that idea here because it's... Oh, uh, yeah, they, so a couple of our routers have it on the fence. This one, it's here on top. Feed direction is from right to left. Okay, I wonder which way it goes. <laughs> so I've had one student in my 14 years here at this school actually do it the wrong way. And it was like putting the board in a pitching machine. Good thing there was nobody standing next to him because it shot it. I'm and, sure. And good thing he let go of it because a lot of people, when they experience kickback, they don't want to let go of their board. They want to save their piece. If you guys get that situation, let go. Yeah. Because your hands are worth way more than what uh, that little piece of wood's yeah, gonna cost. Piece of wood, ten, fifteen dollars. Who cares? But feed direction on the quiz, right to left. If you're in our woodworking class, it's still against the rotation, but it's right to left. So this green thing here, this little I don't know what you call it, a, a slot. What? What? What's that for? If we've already talked about bandsaws and jigsaws, the miter gauge that goes into that, it's basically a T-square, but it's called a miter gauge because it's adjustable. So we can hold our piece at whatever angle. If we're routing a piece that's shorter than the fence or shorter than the bit, we need something to push it across. So don't, again, that comes into the push blocks, push sticks, push pads, anything we can do to prevent violating the margin of safety. So it's a helper. So if you're building your own, what does it take? We actually made this with a router. We set up a guide fence, boom, made the slot. This is a pre-purchased track, or 10 bucks maybe yeah, for the track. It's just screwed in there. And it's, so that gives you a lot of accessory options. Another one that we don't have with us called a feather board or finger board. It helps hold things against the fence. Some people even put them in the uh, fence so that helps hold things down. So there's their drawers, dust collection, People spend weekends designing and building their own router tables. We've kind of kept this semi-portable, semi-inexpensive that way. Well, I mean, it's, it's bigger than the other one, the one that's store-bought. You got a, a nice flat table here, so you can do bigger boards on here, or even smaller ones if you like, but at least you have more support. 
We've got a safety switch here, which seems like it's a really good idea. I think I paid $10 at one of the online vendors for that switch. An adjustable fence for goes both ways, not just by itself. Dust collection, sounds like you got it made. What if you're in a uh, small workshop, like a garage or a basement? Is there a kind of a hidden place you could put a router table, if, especially if you got hint, a table saw? You know what, I've seen pictures of that. Putting this router on the outfeed table or on the, uh, the wing. I, yeah, the people wing build these into their workbenches, they build them into their saw tables. If you're working in the garage by yourself, you're gonna be using one tool at a time. So you don't so. have to worry about storage then. So there's, if you're semi-serious about woodworking, a router is the way to go. Well, from what we talked about earlier, it definitely does a lot of things. So let's wrap this thing up. If you had to buy one router, what would you choose? Oh gosh, that's a really tough one. I mean, for me personally, because of the work I do, I have a plunge. So really, it's up, it's up to you. I'm more of a fixed base router guy that, the, like you said, the plunge router, it'll do everything a fixed base will. Because you can lock it down, you can make it go up and down. Again, separate video on the plunge router. But it has its drawbacks, though. <laughs> it's a lot more set. It's, it's heavier, too. Oh, here's our other router. So on the back table. This is my go-to at home. I have the same exact model. I think we talked about this a little bit earlier in the video. I make sure I get one that has a removable base. I've purchased an extra base for the top, and I've got the plunge kit. So, got it covered. One up. You got it I got covered. a table router, standard router, fixed router. I, I paid for this. I probably spent what you've got in your plunge router, or maybe even a little more. Well, by the, I have to admit, my first router was a fixed base. But I didn't know about plunge routers though either. <laughs> so if you have any other questions, check with your school instructor, other YouTube sites, lumberjocks.com, I don't know, any place else you can think of that I mean we just claim working magazines. We're we're by far no means experts. We what we got 30, 40 years of teaching between us, but the only router accident we've had belongs to me. So I think, I'd say we kind of know what we're doing. A little bit. So hey, leave a comment, like, subscribe to the Warrior Woodshop page. That'll, that'll help us get viewers. We aren't making any money on this. We're trying to help you guys out. Our first focus is the students. But hey, if you're a regular woodworker, you want real people, not DIY network, not HDTV. You can tell we're not chasing cameras around us. We don't, and we got a shop light <laughs> lighting us up here. Leave a comment, leave a question, maybe we'll answer it and get back to you. Thanks for watching.